All right. Well, we have a great panel, um, and I'm not sure I see all of them here. Let me change my view. Um, I'll just go through in the order which they appear. So you have Dr. Sue Swindells, who's from University of Nebraska. We showed work uh, from uh, her on TV a little bit earlier. A colleague of mine here at UAB, Dr. Jody Dion, who is uh, associate professor here and is heavily involved in uh, uh, women in HIV, but especially in uh, not just domestically, but internationally. And Dr. Judy Courier, who uh, is at UCLA and, and a chief of ID there, but also is the leader of the AIDS clinical trials group. We have Dr. Mazur still on. And uh, I believe is, is Dr. Gandhi still here? She's welcome to join in if she's, I see her, her name up and Dr. Bedimo, there he is. Uh, Dr. Roger Bedimo is back, a uh, former uh, fellow with us and um, now uh, an esteemed faculty at the University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas. And I believe he's located in New Orleans right now for a little while. Um, but it's great to have all of, all of our panel here. So um, let's get started. Um, these are my I've just received research grants. Uh, grants. There's no uh, consultation. So what we're going to do, we're going to go through uh, <clears throat> uh, cases uh, with a question up front because these are the types of questions that we all get um, uh, through the year. Uh, some of you have seen my case presentations in other venues. I've changed it for this uh, for today. So there's uh, uh, twists and turns that are different than what you may have heard from me before talking about TDF versus TAF, um, weight gain with uh, antiretroviral therapy, new uh, emerging data on uh, pregnant women and what to use, um, issues about aging, what to do with people with persistent low level of viremia and those folks who have limited treatment options. So here we come to the first question, which is what should I use as initial therapy? Oops. So uh, we have a 48-year-old man who presents with Newly diagnosed HIV, his um, he, whoops, he's asymptomatic. His initial viral load is 280,000. Has a CD4 count of 65, so kind of advanced disease. Other labs are normal. Has a wild type genotype. A normal renal function is okay to start therapy. But before you start, are there any additional labs that you might order? Take a look at the options here, and let's go ahead and vote. You know, this is becoming my favorite song. Um, not sure why. Before the meeting's over, I will uh, create some lyrics. Okay, let's see what we got. All right. So, a majority of people want to get the HLA B5701. Uh, some want, want to get a uh, genotype. Roger, let me turn to you first. Um, is there anything on here that jumps out as you at you as uh, something you might want to get in addition or none of the above? Nothing in addition. I, I think uh, uh, in, in the likely uh, initial regimens for, recommended for most, as the DHHS guidelines call them. <clears throat> and uh, it's important uh, in this person with a uh, uh, CD4 count of less than uh, 60 or uh, less than 100 to consider uh, uh, that they uh, need to be on prophylaxis for PGP and and, and, and toxo. So uh, it is important. And uh, there are some indications of some antiretroviral regimens to do a therapy that may uh, be less efficacious for people with lower CD4 count. So this is an important consideration uh, and, uh, for that. And <clears throat> And, and so that's sort of, uh, I'll leave it to that and I'll let others, uh, comment. Okay. Other thoughts? Yeah, this is Judy. Um, I think the, you know, HLAB 5701 would be something you would only do if you were thinking about using a back of ear and I probably wouldn't be. Um, and you could always do it later if you decided you needed to use it later. I think the INSTI genotype is the one thing that, um, that would be potentially considered in somebody who's had HIV for a while. Um, not, you know, generally it's not done on all patients routinely, but in someone with advanced disease, um, I, I think at our institution it probably would be done. Um, but you wouldn't wait for the result if you, to start treatment. Yeah. Jody? 
Yeah, so, I, you know, in Africa, we see so much cryptococcus um, in patients with HIV. So it's been recommended for a while there to do screening with serum cryptococcal antigen before starting HIV medications. We haven't done it routinely in the U.S., mostly because of cost considerations. Um, the cost effectiveness was, data was not as convincing. But I think it is a, a test that would impact your management in terms of thinking about immune reconstitution for cryptococcal meningitis. Um, we've all seen cases. We have someone in the hospital right now who was started on HIV medicine not long ago and is now has iris with um, cryptococcal meningitis. So I would that was the one I would think about. How about in Nebraska, Sue? So the the, the one test that's not on the list is um, uh, um, IGRA for TB, and uh, I think it's good that it's not on the list because this guy has a CD4 count of 65, and so. Uh, less than 200, the IGRA is likely to be indeterminate or a false negative and just cause confusion and, and waste money. So I wouldn't do that until later on when he's getting better. I, I do tend to do the HLA test at baseline, uh, mostly because it's got, a, in our institution, a bit of a long turnaround time to get the result. And usually you need it in a hurry when they go into renal failure or something. So it's nice to have on file because it won't change over time. And for us, doing genotypes for integrase inhibitors is incredibly low yield. And so it's an expensive test. Mm -hmm. um, I think Rochelle Walensky's group have done some modeling to show that probably that's not a cost-effective thing to do with the rates of resistance as they are, but they, that may vary regionally. Right. And Henry, what about a toxo antibody? What do you think? I think a toxic antibody is always interesting, whether it's helpful, uh, I'm not so sure for two reasons. I mean, one is if you're going to use t uh, uh, trimethoprim sulfur for uh, pneumocystis prophylaxis, you're prophylaxing for toxo anyway. Uh, and a lot of the commercial antibody tests for toxo are not as sensitive as the tests that they used to do. You know, in the old ages, they did the Sabin Feldman, then they did a more sensitive, uh, 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 test and the rapid tests are now. So there's a fair false negativity uh, rate. So uh, uh, I think it's useful, but I'd say it's pretty low yield. Okay. Well, a great start. So let me just kind of run through why I put these up. So the, we talked about this, the NC genotype. If you sense that there's a high level of resistance in your neck of the woods, yes, but otherwise it's not cost effective. And there aren't many places where it does have a high level. A toxo antibody we just heard, but that's a carryover from the early days before we had better antiretroviral therapy, and now we tend to just get it when there's a brain lesion and we're trying to differentiate. And then the HLA-B5701, um, Judy Courier just gave us a good rundown. We don't use much abacavir anymore up front since there's other options. Uh, histoantigen, maybe if we're living in Costa Rica, or in some places like that, but in general, not so much except as indicated for febrile illness. But the serum cryptococcal antigen is a changing concept, and Jody got to this very nicely. Um, the, the latest ISUSA guidelines from a couple weeks ago is now actually recommending uh, cryptococcal in an antigen testing because the price has come down. And Jody, you mentioned the cost effectiveness and it's come down so low that it's now considered cost effective. And as you pointed out in that one case, I mean, this could have saved this person in admission. And, and the idea is to catch it before it becomes meningitis where you could get away probably with fluconazole up front. And, and so now, even though there's not a huge number, based on the experience of Africa, as you nicely mentioned, uh, it's now recommended as a routine thing in the U.S. Um, so let's go on to this guy. I'll just remind everybody he had a lowish CD4 count and a modestly high viral load. Uh, what regimen would you choose? Uh, it's going to take a lot of decipher. Just kind of dig, deal with it, and we'll go ahead and vote as we go. Let's run the poll. Let me guess what the music is going to be. Ah. For those of you who weren't on the panel earlier, this is the same song we now have heard. I'm, my count is 22 times. <laughs> I think it's either um, Mac the Knife from Berthold Breck or it's uh, Herb, Herbie Mann at Village Gate. Playing as a uh, flute, not the 1957. 
Okay, let's see what we got. All right, most people are going with the Bictegravir-based regimen. We have a genotype back. Um, the other options for TAF, FTC, Dalutegravir. Um, I think what's interesting is what's not picked. Nobody went uh, with Abacavir, maybe because of the comments we made earlier. Just open it up to anybody who wants to sort of dig in here to some of the answers. Um, <clears throat> this is Judy. I'll, I'll start. I, this is really interesting, and I think that, you know, maybe a year ago, uh, there were people that were really still nervous about um, not using boosted PIs in people with advanced disease. And I think just seeing the full shift over to first-line integrase across the spectrum is really been very well cemented. So I, I completely agree with that choice. Um, it may be that, um, you know, and also a single tablet, there's less copay, um, fewer drug interactions. So I, I think it's, I think this is really this would be what would be chosen in, in our clinic. There are still some providers using that would pick um, TAF and FTC and Dolutegravir, but sometimes the extra copay and having two pills versus one uh, is a challenge. So okay. I, I agree with the group. All right. How about anybody uh, excited about a boosted PI at this point or a boosted uh, uh, INSTE like Elvitegravir? This is still not, not keen on the boosted INSTE. Um, very occasionally, boosted PI is sometimes an option if you've got someone who's very wobbly and you're really not confident they're going to take their medicine because they are pretty bulletproof. But um, I think in our clinic, we'd have gone with a big Tegravir containing regimen just like everyone else did. The other okay. comment I have was interesting is that nobody was really keen on the 3TC dolutegravir dual therapy, even though the data on that are looking pretty good, and that has some potential advantages too, but I can't see the full now, but the numbers were very low, I think. Right, let's pick up on that. So let's say you started on the regimen you just said with big tegravir. Would there be a time where you just switch over to that? I mean, just once they get it under control, I mean, you could the data support it using in this setting, although lower CD4 counts, the data are not as robust. But let's say they're, they're six months to a year into therapy, and you might want to just kind of simplify this, get away from the tenofovir. Jody, is that something you consider doing? He's got wild-type virus, and uh, I would guess it would respond. Yeah, I mean, I think the switch studies have been pretty convincing, Mike. Like you said, once you get them fully suppressed, I wouldn't start with it based on the CD4 and viral load that he has right now. I would consider it in the future if he's doing well. But in a way, a one pill once a day, two versus three um, components within that pill, I'm not sure the patient would notice any meaningful difference. Right. Yeah. I it would I mean, it be might more. be that, you know, Sue was saying before, check the HLA B57 in case they get renal failure and you want to switch to a Bacavir. Well, instead of switching to a Bacavir, I would do this. If someone developed renal insufficiency, go to the two drug combination without the TAF or TDF. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, Henry, if you don't mind, I can't see the Q and A. So if folks are asking questions, if you don't mind just peppering those in as we go, uh, and then we'll just combine the Q and A time with this. So we'll just continue. Is that Okay. Sure. Uh, uh, Kevin uh, Armington wanted to know, why do you think so many people prefer Bictegravir over Dolutegravir? I'll turn it to the panel. Roger, do you have an opinion on that? Uh, not one based on data, ex except if you want to go away from answer three because of uh, two different fields and two copays. I have not had any uh, seen any significant difference between the use of Bictegravir and Dolutegravir. Maybe some nausea that we've seen more of with uh, Dolly than Big Tegravir. So those I will consider them equivalent in terms of uh, virologic efficacy and safety and maybe just uh, the simplicity of uh, three, uh, five over three. Yeah. And for the few of us who are, I think it's worth commenting that the few of us who are on this panel who have been at this for quite a while, um, <laughs> when you sit back and look at the effectiveness of these newer regimens, it's just mind blowing. Uh, this is something we never anticipated, uh, mm -hmm. even in the wildest dream. Um, so this is pretty cool. Anybody want to comment? Maybe Jody on the Favrins, because 
it's used sometimes in Africa still. I know that it's mostly gone to integrase up front, but what do you think about 400 milligrams versus 600 milligrams if you're going to use a fovereign? This is available in the U.S. generically right now. What do you think? Yeah, so I would not choose a fabrins. I mean, mostly because of the 25% um, neuropsychiatric side effects that we still see so commonly. Um, I, I I really consider it inferior both urologically and from side effects, so I wouldn't reach for that one. Yeah. And, the and other even country- in Africa, like you mentioned, almost every country is switching over to dolutegravir-based therapy, so they're also predominantly right. making the switch. But I think the point was, as well, is to what you said, that the 400 milligrams has now been found to be roughly equivalent to 600, which was our standard dose before. Right. And going back to, the, again, those of us who were around when uh, Afavirans was first released, um, the 600 milligrams was just kind of a compromised dose. There was never really solid comparative data. They just said, all right, well, we're going to go with the higher dose because it seems to be side effect-wise the same, but it really is – uh, better side effects profile with 400. And then the final point I'll make, and we'll move on, um, is for ropivirine, we're probably not going to use that in this setting because the viral load is, is higher. Um, so let's, uh, let me get to the next. And yeah, these Mike, are the Mike, Mike, let me ask you, uh, uh, Nogashella wants to know why you're ignoring data from Advance and Namsol. From the, for the, uh, okay, let's turn to the panel. Other thoughts about, um, anybody remember the advanced study? I yeah, so I, I think that I, I take a first crack at it. This is the uh, uh, the study in South Africa uh, looking at where the standard of care uh, was uh, dolitegravir uh, 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 TTC plus uh, f 5 and then they looked at uh, using uh, 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 TAP FTC, uh, sorry, uh, it was uh, TDF FTC plus f 5 and they looked at using uh, TDF-FTC plus dolitegravir or TAF-FTC plus dolitegravir compared to the standard of care of uh, TDF-FTC uh, uh, plus uh, epivirenz. And uh, while virologically the three regimens were found to be equivalent, the highlight have been the differences in weight gain in this 99 plus percent uh, 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 African descent population and the, the weight gain being uh, twice as uh, likely in women, uh, the magnitude being twice as great in women than in men. Uh, NAMSA was in my uh, home country of Cameroon, uh, also uh, had the same conclusions of uh, 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 weight gain in mostly women. Okay, thank you. Um, so the ISUSA guidelines and the HHS guidelines are very similar a few nuances here and there, but I think what's worth pointing out here is the dolutegravir lamivudine up front. We talked about it, but these caveats listed at the bottom of the slide are very important. And for those of you who took the pretest, this was where there was an incorrect answer. When somebody is hepatitis B surface antigen positive, you really shouldn't use dolutegravir with lamivudine because all you have for the hepatitis B is lamivudine, and within 20 weeks or so, you're going to get a resistant virus. So you really need the tenofovir in that setting. So hopefully if anybody got that pretest question wrong, it, they'll now get it right because it's a, it's a, it's a pretty straightforward thing. But these are the other higher viral load. Um, it's mostly the lower CD4 count. They're just, it's not that it's not working quite as well. It's just a subset of patients were so small and they didn't do quite as well, but it wasn't robust because there weren't enough people. Uh, and I think most people lean away from it for an op, uh, an active OI, although, as we discussed, you might be able to switch to it uh, later. So let's move on to the next question. Um, providers are starting ARV therapy really is close to the diagnosis. So if you are going to start a regimen, like in the ER, uh, not all of us are doing that, but if you were, what might be the regimen? So which regimen should you avoid in the setting when you're in the ER, let's go ahead and vote. There's a couple of incorrect answers here. They changed the music. Oh, awesome. Sounds like Christmas time on acid or something like that. <laughs> Okay, let's see what we got. All right, panel, comments? 
Yeah, so, I, think, I think the audience are right. More than half of them would avoid the back of the ear. And if you don't know, someone may have a hypersensitive reaction. That's very uh, sensible. Yep. Right. And, and the, the, the value tag of our 3TC, there, there are some studies I know that uh, the company that makes the product is looking at for immediate therapy before there's a genotype. Anybody uh, want to comment on that? The, before there's a, you know about the M184V uh, or the hepatitis. Um, any thoughts on that? I think I would have those two considerations you had, um, uh, and especially the latter, uh, hepatitis. Uh, uh, even if it's likely that resistance of uh, HPV to 3GC will not develop that quickly, and that you will have the the, <clears throat> the, the uh, hepatitis B cytogen testing uh, within a week or so, but there's a consideration. Yeah. So we got a very sophisticated audience who's pretty in tune. I think they didn't pick the ropivirine because the viral load could be high. They didn't pick uh, the the abacavir because of the absence of a B5701, although you could op- you could probably switch it off after a week, but it's just not it's not very aesthetic anyway. Um, and then the boosted PI could work. I mean, that's not that's not a bad choice. Um, uh, so let's go ahead and move on. So this is becoming an important issue just over time as TDF becomes generic. What do you think about TAF versus TDF up front? Would you use, you have one preference, TAF, TDF, or either one? Go ahead and vote. This one was composed by Henry Mazur. Um, all right. What do you all think? Uh, Judy, any thoughts on TAF versus TDF? Yeah. I mean, I think people kind of voted in the first question by picking the Bictarvi TAF FTC combination for initial therapy. And I think that, um, that there's certainly, um, maybe long-term tolerability issues with TAF. I, I think outside of the boosted PI, outside of use with the boosted PI, some of those differences may be smaller. Um, but I think that the, um, in the fact that, you know, it comes as a co- combination with Bictarvi FTC and the efficacy of that combination, that would lean me towards using it. Yeah. Other thoughts? So I, I, this, this is so that the the differences, as Judy says, are really very small. I know, you know, as our population ages and they get this creatinine creep and, um, you know, particularly people with, you know, high blood pressure and so on, I get a lot of questions from the nurse practitioners about what to do, and they often think that switching someone from to, from TDF to TAF will solve the problem, but it really doesn't. I mean, it makes a small difference. You know, Roger knows much more about this than I do, but um, I think, to be honest, I think the the audience was right. There were a lot of people said either, and I agree. Yeah. Before I get to Roger, because I've got a specific question. Jody, you were about to say something. Well, I was just going to say, I, you know, I do think that if there's a reason for TAF, obviously it's the right choice. Bone problems, elderly age, renal insufficiency. I think that the weight gain with TAF is concerning to me. I practice in an area where the obesity rate is really quite high, and especially in the women I'm taking care of. Uh, yeah, so I, I think that is something that is worthy of discussion with the patient about why you pick one over the other. And I think the cost consideration is also important. We may not see the implications of the drugs we prescribe, but this there's a very big difference between these two drugs for cost. That, that impacts me. All right, so I'm going to hold Roger's comment because it's going to play into the next case. Uh, but I will say that I, I really want to underscore uh, Judy Courier's comment that a lot of the badness, if you will, of TDF is when you pair it up with a booster like cobacistat or ritonavir, and that's when you really see very high serum level, plasma levels of, of tenofovir, uh, that you don't see as much when in a non-booster, and I think that was leading to more prevalence of the uh, bone and renal problems. Not the head to head TDF certainly a titch more in the way of that, but uh, versus TAF. But 
Um, not as dramatic as in a situation where you have a booster. So I'm going to bring Roger in on this one. So we see ARV associated weight gain. What do we do about it? So I'm not going to get embroiled in does it happen? I think we're, you know, well past that. Yes, it seems to. So let's show this case. This is a woman who started on the audience's favorite regimen based on earlier voting. Um, and she 12 months ago, uh, her initial viral load wasn't all that spectacular, 28,000, and wild-type virus CD4 count was 450. Her current RNA is less than 20, and her C4 count's a whopping 930. But her weight increased from 12 months ago from 145 pounds to 171. So this is going to go right to Roger and then to the rest of the panel. Uh, let's see what the audience thinks. Would you keep her on her current regimen, sort of a George Herbert Walker book, you know, stay the course, change wouldn't be prudent, or switch her to one of these other options? Go ahead and vote. of a mellow song out of the L.A. scene around 1970. You know, Big Eagle, who knows? Linda Ronstadt, let's see. Okay. All right, Roger, enlighten us. You are the maven here on weight gain with uh, studying weight gain and antiretrovirals. What do you think? I wish I was, uh, Dr. Sag. Uh, all I can say is that we've gotten to this point because of some safety signals with Pata. Otherwise, it looks like everybody had made, or most people had made a blanket switch from uh, TBF to TAF. And now it looks like we're putting the bones and the kidneys in one, on one end of the balance and the fat on the other, uh, deciding whether uh, uh, to, to switch away from uh, TAF FTC. From the answers that you see here, uh, I think that I would take it one step back and say that prior to the initiation of this uh, antiretroviral regimen, which is something we started doing, we owe the patient candle that uh, to tell them that they are uh, they're in one of the demographics that are more likely to gain weight. We cannot predict whether or by how much the uh, 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 the weight will increase. And two, we are not certain of whether uh, of the reversibility if we switch this person away from the current regimen because now uh, options that you gave us uh, uh, ask us to see if we can switch away from TAF only of away from TAF and integrase inhibitors. Maybe both would be called for. I just think that we owe the patient candle that we don't know whether that would uh, change uh, uh, anything in the trajectory. And a very important ACTG study uh, soon on the way, uh, Dr. Curio will probably give us that answer, which is uh, very, very much uh, uh, awaited. Others? Um, yeah, this is Judy. I mean, I think we don't know. And as, as Roger mentioned, there is a trial called the, that's getting started that will randomize people to stay the course or switch to Duraverine, either with TAF or TDF, to see whether which of these components might be contributing. You know, weight gain is multifactorial, and certainly in the starting therapy, you know, people are having a, some of this is return to health, and then some. This is also a perimenopausal aged woman, um, and unfortunately, people do gain weight as they go through the menopause transition, and then, so that may be contributing as well. So I, I think in in parallel with talking about the uncertainties of switching ART, I would really get a you know get a really good sense of the um, of the person the woman's um, level of activity and diet, and to see where else we might intervene to help uh, to return help to um, look at the weight. And then I would also want to see whether this was, I mean, I don't know what her BMI is. Um, was this person, you know, under how tall is she? Was she underweight and is she now obese? And are there other signs of sort of metabolic abnormalities with her um, fasting blood sugar and hemoglobin A1C and her lipids that would push me more towards um, taking action more rapidly. So you have to kind of look at the whole picture, I think. What's a little metformin among friends? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> All right. 
Um, so let me move on just in the interest of time. Although, Henry, are there any questions that are germane to this or that you're seeing in the Q&A? Muted. I, I don't see any at the moment. Okay. All right. So this is the hierarchy of weight gain. I think we're familiar with this. My question is, notice that a lot of that weight gain is happening in that first year. Because why I made it a 12-month thing. And then it seems to plateau. And I'm not sure. Do you all make anything of that? I, I, I've struggled with the data, and I think that it seems to be consistent. Or, I mean, uh, consistent with what the opera that you just briefly showed uh, showed in uh, in people who are already uh, antiretroviral uh, experience and suppressed. Where there was a bump in, uh, in in weight change within the first nine months, it appears that the majority of the weight change in these two uh, uh, contexts was front loaded. We did not see that in all studies. Uh, we did not see that in advanced that was mentioned earlier, where up to week 96 there appears to be no hint of a plateau in women who were gaining weight. So this is. Intriguing, but it, it's important to note that it has not been universally observed in, 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 in studies of Yeah, and we, we got to this a little bit in the prep section. Um, it doesn't seem to be as dramatic in prep, and that is un- HIV, HIV non-infected individuals. But I guess it's, we see a little bit of it with CABO, uh, but not, it doesn't seem to the same degree. Yeah, I think there's this also this relative, um, weight loss with TDF versus, um, you know, it's, it's the, it's our, on average that there's more weight loss with, with TDF that makes the weight gain with TAF look greater. So it's, it's the absence of weight loss from being on TDF. And the place where we're seeing this play out really interestingly is in pregnant women. Um, in the vested trial that randomized women to uh, receive dolutegravir with either TDF or TAF or favarins with TDF, um, you know, um, incomplete weight gain or low weight gain is a problem in pregnancy. It's associated with poor outcomes. And so TAF was actually protective by ensuring weight gain during pregnancy. There were fewer adverse be- birth outcomes in the women who got TAF uh, versus TDF. Hmm. So it's all relative, I think. Um, yeah. So that has to be kept in mind. So, Judy, to be fair on the vested trial, it's hard to know if the if the African population is going to be generalizable. Um, is that is that data consistent at the African sites versus the U.S. Europe sites? I I don't know. Yeah, I think that yeah, it was mostly in sites yeah. outside the U.S. But um, that's it's a good point, and there'll be more coming out about that in the next year. So, um, really drilling down into those data at this point. But I I think it's. You know, there's weight gain and there's weight loss. So um, yeah. it has to all be put together. But it's like you guys, they did not, everyone, they did not see the slides ahead of time. So this is spontaneous, but they're doing a great job of leading into the next case. So this is fabulous. Sorry about that. No, no, no. Actually, I love it. It's it's helpful. Uh, and, and please, uh, Dr. Mike, Mike, before you move into the next thing, let me ask you one question that did pop up uh, about which gets uh, to uh, – uh, one of the issues you sort of perfectly met. When do you routinely get DEXA or osteoporosis screening in people who have been on TDF long term? And let's say for an older, like meaning older, relatively speaking, for somebody over the age of 45 to. Well, do, do you, I guess the question is do you wait till 65 or do you uh, accelerate let's, your schedule? Let's turn to the panel. What do you guys think? I think the, the current uh, uh, guidelines, uh, um, I think there will be data now, 2015, if uh, memory serves me right, uh, suggest that we begin at 50 uh, yeah. you know, uh, in people living with HIV, uh, i.e. 20 or so uh, years uh, earlier than men uh, without HIV. And one caveat I would like to put to that is that I know we have been enamored with uh, uh, biomarkers, but it's still not clear that DEXA scan is a good predictor of uh, the bone fragility uh, in people living with HIV uh, uh, exposed with antiretrovirus uh, or otherwise. This is data that is not there. And and so I'm not sure that, uh, I mean, while we should follow this guidance, 
we're not like we we shouldn't necessarily give it all the credits that we give to a Dexas can in the post menopausal woman. Okay, so I, just I'll make a couple comments. One is that whatever we do normally, uh, we might frame shift that back ten years earlier, and that could apply to a lot of screening um, activities. And so I think whenever we might ordinarily get a Dexa maybe ten years earlier is just a a rule of thumb. It is not hard and fast data. And what uh, Dr. Bedimo was just referencing is that, and I think in the last week, right, the primary care guidelines just came out. Melanie Thompson is the lead author on it, and that's a good reference for all of us. Um, segueing now to the pregnant um, patient, this is a 30-year-old woman who presented with newly diagnosed HIV that was detected as she presented uh, with, uh, for her first perinatal Evaluation, she's six weeks pregnant. The CD4 count and viral load are remarkably exactly the same as our last patient. Um, the uh, labs are normal. B5701 was obtained, wild-type virus, first pregnancy. Okay to start therapy if you think she should. Of course you do. And But the question now is what would you use? This is coming right to you, Dr. Dion. So let's uh, see what's, what the audience says. <laughs> Actually, have some Aaron Copeland, by the way, was Leonard Bernstein's mentor. Let's see what we got. Jody, what you think? Yeah, so this is a sort of evolving area, and it's really fascinating. When I talk to pregnant women with HIV, she's coming in really early, so it's great you're catching her at six weeks with the diagnosis, which is how we pick up a lot of our women. Um, The discussion I always say is that pregnancy is a little bit different with HIV. We like to use the drugs that have the most data so that we can know that they're safe, both from a teratogenic perspective, but also from dosing of HIV medicines in the second and the third trimester, which is complicated with the physiologic changes of pregnancy. So the DHHS guidelines um, have for a long time recommended boosted atazanavir with the backbone of TDF FTC as the recommended um, medication once daily, well tolerated on good safety data with some concern about um, about early deliveries in women on boosted on protease inhibitors. So large studies clearly suppressing the virus with something she's going to take is the most important option. Um, with increasing good safety data on dolutegravir coming from Africa, all the work um, done by Rebecca Zash in Botswana with Sipamo study, showing us that over time, the initial concern about the neural tube defect has decreased such that now the increased risk is about one per 1,000 women in their cohort of about 1,700 women who had first trimester dolutegravir exposure. We know that dolutegravir in the second and third trimester are safe, um, and I think that the evolution of the guidelines, including the ones that you just um, co-authored, Mike, are now recommending dolutegravir as first-line therapy. Um, so I would have a conversation with her. I think that usually women are totally in line when I say I want to give you something that has the best data for safety in pregnancy. And the sooner you're no longer pregnant, we can go back to a one pill once a day option. And that's pretty um, acceptable to most of them. And they do great for the most part. That's a wonderful summary. Um, oh, let's just kind of have the panel go through and shout out the things that you wouldn't use on this out of this listening, listing because it relates to one of the pre-test questions. So anything with Kobe – Sista, right? Sure. Right, Sue, so, go ahead. Yes, I mean, yes, uh, don't use Kobe. Um, I can't remember what this one's numbers were. They're pretty good. So t- theoretically, real pivoting, but I don't do it because uh, in my experience, so many pregnant women uh, experience some form of heartburn or dyspepsia and need antacids and a PPI, and then you got to switch it so it's easier not to to do that. I don't think they've seen any data on just 3TC dolutegravir. No, there's not. So that would be a wrong answer. In pregnancy and, you know, we all know about the but we now have better tolerated and 
um, more efficacious antiretroviral agents that I think pregnant women should be offered. Right. So a lot of a lot of correct answers. Just the question is, I think as Jody pointed out nicely, uh, it's really a question of flavor. Uh, what you know, what what chocolate or or vanilla or strawberry here? But uh, the the trick is getting the viral load down, and in the in the six weeks the neural tube is formed, so that becomes even out of the picture. But I think you you well summarized how that's changed for those of us again who have been around a while. Remember when a Favern's got released and neural tube defects? It's like what? It's total deja vu, and it went through the exact same sort of experience where everyone said, "Oh, you can't use it. It's a category whatever D or X or something. Uh, you never should use that in pregnancy." And then it softened as more data came in, and so it became a preferred regimen after about two or three years of data. So that's what we see. Um, so Mike, what that begs is better studies, right? I mean, the vested trial is a great example. We have the antiretroviral pregnancy registry, um, but usually first trimester exposures are low. A couple, oh, you have it, do you have it here? Yeah, yeah. So a couple hundred women with first trimester exposure. So better studies include pregnant women early. That's really critical for us to have drug seeds. Right. So I, I, I don't expect people to read this on the fly. This will be in the slide set that you can read afterwards. Um, and then this is the uh, other studies, I think, that you mentioned. And um, this showed that a, a more rapid drop in viral load, as you expect, right, with Uh One thing I think we can all agree on, that it's always a good idea to give folate. Um, and the, there's a lot of data that shows that a folate deficiency can induce or be associated with a uh, more higher prevalence of neural tube defect. And there also are some data that there's interaction between uh, diotegravir and to some degree of fovereigns and folate uh, binding uh, in some kind of way. Judy, were you going to make that point? Um, no, I would, well, I was just going to make one point um, with, with the regimens, real pivoting, I agree with Sue, I wouldn't select it, but it's not specifically not recommended in pregnancy the way etrovirine is not recommended. It's just a small caveat there, but I, I completely agree. Uh, that's a great point. And the viral load was low, so it's probably okay and would work, but it's just not a necessarily, I don't think anybody call it a go-to drug. And especially if you're going to have to use uh, PPIs or something along the way or, or whatever you would use to control acid. Yeah. Um, Mike, Mike, you didn't have raltegravir on your list of options, even right. though I was looking that's that. also considered preferred for pregnancy, yeah. as a with yeah. more experience as was, was was pointed they, out already. I think yeah. for women that are worried about the neural tube defect, even though we know the risk is really very tiny, uh, you know that may be an option to consider. Okay. So, as Jody alluded to, that. Dietegravir is now a preferred, but there are others. So that's why I go back to my pick your, pick your flavor and move on. And it is a discussion with the, with the, with the patient to see, uh, after you discuss the data, what they prefer. All right. So moving on, um, our folks are getting older. That's great. Um, as are we. Um, and so the question is, what do we do, uh, in terms of evaluating? So here we've got this guy who was diagnosed 17 years ago. He's now 60. Doing great. I mean, it's like every, most of our visits nowadays. Uh, it's it's not the HIV. You almost don't talk about. Uh, it's it's the, all the other stuff. Um, he's on fixed dose combination, Bictegravir, TAF FTC. So, would you assess his cognitive function as a matter of routine? And if so, how? So the first would be uh, conducted that these should be done. Uh, based on uh, a patient's report of memory trouble or done uh, annually or every other year or only when they say, when you ask the question, how are you thinking, uh, or some other answer. Go ahead and vote. Down by the river tonight? Yeah. Sounds like it's down by the riverside at a Barnum and Bailey circus. Okay. Um, so let's see what we got. Um, 
Roger, you have an opinion on this? Cognitive function and routine assessment, what do you think should be done? I, I would agree with the, the majority. Ever since the charter studies uh, several years ago, it's, uh, up, uh, it's, it's obvious that mild cognitive dysfunction is more common than appreciated in people living with HIV and that we could we shouldn't wait for symptoms to be obvious if we wanted to detect it early. Uh, it's another matter of whether we can do anything about it or not, but uh, early detection would be. Uh, <laughs> hey, you got problems. Best of luck. We're rooting for you. Yeah. Um, what, what, what are those things? Yeah, I think Roger is exactly right. You know, it's all very well to do these tests, but, and then you worry about it. The patient's worried. They think their brain is broken. And, but what can you do about it? You know, all of the studies that have been um, conducted in adjunctive therapy for cognitive decline have failed. Sorry. The issue of, you know, CNS penetrance doesn't really seem to correlate with any clinical outcomes that we can uh, use to, to base any treatment decisions. So other than, uh, you know, just in, in general supportive care, maybe in, encouraging them to get someone help with their medicine adherence or POA or living will or something. I'm not sure what you do about this. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I agree. I guess that there are, the, you know, I'm, I'm kind of an optimist. And I mean, I think the thing that I would I would do is, you know, sc- screen for depression, really look at their med list, make sure there aren't other things that are contributing to their cognitive decline. I completely agree that our interventions for HIV-associated cognitive decline are limited, but there are other things that contribute to some of these changes that we always have to keep an eye out for, other medical comorbidities. Yeah, and I've talked to gerontologists and say, okay, guys, what do you do when somebody gets to be a certain age? Do you routinely assess for cognition? And they go, no. (laughs) And you're like, well, when do you do it? Well, when the family complains or somebody complains. And I, I think this is where actually the HIV field is going to lead the way because there is becoming, I think, more and more of a sense that we should catch this. And, and in addition to the polypharmacy stuff we talked about and drug interactions or other depression is key, maybe some occult substance use. Um, th- there's also always benefit from exercise and diet and uh, we, we can sort of help people double down on that. And uh, just to quickly go through this in the interest of time, um, these are the things that we want to focus on as a polypharmacy of frailty and occult uh, neurocognitive impairment. And for neurocognitive impairment screening, the problem is there's the, the, the right way to do it is this long hour plus or maybe two hour evaluation because you, it sor- sorts out depression versus other things. Sometimes it's executive function, sometimes it's memory. But there are becoming available to us uh, kind of quick evaluations, be it uh, MOCA or um, even on uh, computer systems. And I'm sorry, I don't know the names of all of them, but I know the University UCSF has a quick screening thing. There's some uh, commercially available ones that are kind of expensive that are electronic, like the UCSF one that, that takes people through questions and, and goes from there. But but I think we're leaning towards it. How often? I don't know. Uh, the audience sort of felt annually is enough um, um, or is sufficient maybe every other year, but I think we'll learn that as we go. Um, how about frailty? Let's ask that question. Uh, is anybody doing that routinely? And if you do it, is it not at all when you suspect somebody has a frail phenotype or at regular intervals? Let's go ahead and vote. Uh oh. Are you all seeing the uh, poll? I'm not. No. Okay. Well, let's just have a discussion. Oh, here it is. All right, let's go ahead. And... Thoughts in general. 
that's a pretty good split across the board here. I think we don't, it, it really shows it's an area where we don't really know. I, I, I need to go read the primary care guidelines and see what they say. Um, you know, we've been doing this in, in the context of a study and, um, the chair rising test, I think is a really good quick thing oh. that I, you know, that, that I've started just because we did it in a study. I've, I've tried doing that, um, do it to myself regularly as well. Um, but I think it is, I, I think it is something again, you know, what just understanding a person's functional status may really help you manage a lot of how they deal with their medical care. So I think it's reasonable, but I, I just don't think we have clear uh, guidance on what to do. Well, the ISUSA, the recent guidelines uh, for ARV therapy has this section recommended every other year cognitive assessment and also recommended frailty assessments to be done regularly. In the sit stand, you can almost imagine in a clinic, somebody coming in, they sit down for their vital signs and you have them. The key is you don't let the, you have to hold their hands here and do the sit stand, maybe a, a 10 meter walk. That's another good thing. Hand grip is one that you can evaluate. And, and these are the, uh, these are the types of things that can happen. Um, the phenotype, uh, we, we know, uh, cause we see it. It's not unique to HIV. It happens to hope. I mean, all of us, if we're fortunate enough to get older, it comes with the territory. Um, but, but slow gait, low physical activity. And this is where training, uh, a physical trainer, physical therapy, more activity really reverses some of this. And that's really helpful. Um, and we can go from there. These are the different things that's in the, uh, if you go to the ISUSA guidelines that were just published, there's a supplement, there's supplement material online that describes all of this to make it easy for folks, uh, to see it. I think we're just beginning to figure out how to implement it, and that's why I included it in today's program, just to kind of bring everyone's attention to it. Now, let's get back to the clinical uh, HIV scene. What do you do with the patient who has persistently detectable viremia? So this is a story of a 54-year-old man who was diagnosed 18 years ago, initially had a really high viral load C in a low CD4 count, and his CD4 count now is... 18 years later, uh, is backed up to 525 and is, but his viral load is persistently detectable. It's never been below 20 and rarely below 50, but it doesn't go above 100. And this has gone on for quite a few years. And he's been on these sort of panoply of different regimens, like most of our patients who have been around for a while and has now settled into a dalutegravir boosted darunavir and 3TC. There's no resistance test. Would you change his therapy now? Go ahead and vote. All right, most people would stay the course here. Um, anybody on the panel want to comment? Would you change? Would you stay? What would you do? Uh, this is Sue. I would agree in completely with the audience. You know, he's on a potent regimen with relatively uh, low risk of resistance to the elements of it. And so, in theory, that should work. You know, you don't want to always blame the patient, but you didn't bring up the adherence issue and really, you know, how much of this is the guy taking. And so we all know the difficulties of trying to measure that, but sometimes refill history can be helpful or getting him set up with, um, you know, having his medicines packaged, something like that. You can do a, a plasma drug concentration, depending on the drug. It may be difficult to interpret. It might tell you something. Other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, this whole concept of unsuppressible RNA or, you know, persistent low-level viremia, the absence of resistance is a real thing. And um, especially in people who have really high viral loads, when they start, it takes longer. They have this, re they release virus that doesn't seem to start new cycles of replication. And, and we got to learn how to live with this. Um, yeah. um, it is really, there's some studies going on now to try to quantify this. And it, it's a real problem in clinical practice for 
for patients who get their labs back through their app that says detected. And, um, but yeah, well, you're going to talk about it better than, than I just did, but. Yeah, you did great. So the thing to remember is that the antiretroviral therapy, all it does is stop de novo infection of susceptible CD4 cells. And if that were happening, even if it were poor adherence or whatever, then you would slowly get emergence of resistance. It would creep up, right, to 200, then 400 to get a resistance assay. But that's not what's happening here. And I think, Judy, you touched on this, that it's really these latently infected cells that seem to be in larger population, larger numbers, when somebody had a baseline viral load that was very high to begin with because viral load, as we know, is proportional to the number of cells in the body producing virus. So they had a lot of these cells, and these things go on. And John Mellers and his team just had a study that showed very nicely this clonal uh, relationship of the viruses that are emerging. And so it's not it's not failure. I think it's not regimen failure, and I think that's the take-home point. And if they're comfortable with the regimen and you just got to, you know, put the blinkers on, uh, I've got these horses above my head, put the blinkers on and just plow straight ahead and uh, and not change therapy. I think that's the key thing. Um, Mike, Mike how, long, how high would you let them go? I'll see what the panel thinks. I, I usually, uh, I'm not too worried if it stays below 100. I think the, the panic value, if you will, or where you need to think about is when it goes above 200. There, that you typically don't see this kind of spit out of a virus. Other any counter counter opinion? No, I agree. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree. Right. So here's the thing: that there are some data that show that people with kind of low level viremia, but they went quite high to 999, that they actually had worse outcomes as far as survival. Um, but I don't think we're seeing that in the people like I just said. I think if we were to look at less than 100, um, here's a 200. It showed some degree of, of issue. But, I, again, I, I'm not sure what that means exactly. Certainly, anybody with high-level viremia, the mortality is quite high. So I'm going to finish up with this uh, uh, thing, and then we'll throw out some questions here. Um, but what do we do with a patient who's experiencing virologic failure? And I don't have a case but I did want to show these data and just have folks comment on the new drugs. This is a scenic study that just got published in AIDS. And what it's looking at is people with limited treatment options, which is defined as less than two drugs as they, the regimen fails. And that's something we used to see all the time. 8% of our folks in virologic faith. And those of us who lived through that, we struggled and T20 came along and we used that for a while. And it was hard to find a single drug at the Introduction of integrase inhibitors, this difficulty of finding at least two drugs has mostly disappeared, and the and it's less than 8%. So those of you who took the home quiz, less than 8%, I think that was answer A, uh, is the correct answer because these data have shown just, and this study was extremely well done by the University of Washington group leading it and did all kinds of incredible algorithms to capture these data. And what was also remarkable is that the ability to get to undetectable virus was no different, even when they had limited treatment options. It's quite striking. And that's this particular graph surprised me. I was expecting it still to be off, but those, as as Carl Grenfell would say, them's the data. So final part. Uh, what we would we use? Anybody want to make some commentary about the two new drugs, the Belizumab and Fostimzivir? Had any experience with those? Not much because there's not many patients who are having <laughs> treatment failure, I guess. Yeah. I think you can use them together now, which was a problem before, but um, that that is a better option to be able to use them both. Um, when you're in this situation. Yeah. So I think a lot of people do include 3TC and FTC just because there's still about a half a log benefit. Joe Iron showed that in 1994 in a, in a study or 95. It was uh, just monotherapy, which we don't do anymore, but you still saw some activity. If they have integrase inhibitor resistance, we still want to use an integrase perhaps 
but you have to use the only one available for this is dietegravir, 50 milligrams twice daily. The complicating factor is a lot of the folks who are ending up in this situation are people who had trouble taking medicine. And so now you're giving twice daily regimens and you kind of, ah, and the same is true for boosted darunavir. You oftentimes will give twice daily, but your, your back's against the wall and you do the best you can. Um, but the, no, the notion that we have these two new agents, uh, relatively new, although ibalizumab is quite expensive, uh, cause it's a monoclonal antibody. So, um, Mike, Mike, your, your boss wants me to ask you a couple of questions before you yes, do the please. Yes, we've one got is, some few one, minutes. One, yeah, one is if somebody wanted to do a frailty screen, uh, is there any screen that would be quick that somebody could recommend? Yeah, we talked about that. I think the sit stand, it's a 10, 10 sit stands from a chair, not using your arms. And I think you want to get it done, I think in less than 30 seconds or something or 20 seconds. Um, so you do that rather than than a gait test? Yeah, the gait test would be a 10 meter walk. And again, um, it's, it's a speed. You could make it shorter if it was in the clinic. You just have to look at the validated models. And then there's a little hand grip that's an assessment of how this relative strength in the hand, uh, correlates to frailty. And that, and that's right. two, two other quick questions. One, do you want to make a comment on the fact that older doctors are more sensitive to cognitive screening than younger doctors? I don't understand the question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I think so. No, I, I look, you know, the question. Right. I mean, I think, look, the goal is to live a long, full life where you're functional uh, the majority of the time. I mean, Judy Courier's mom is a great example who, who, uh, sorry to say, recently passed away, but what a, what a wonderful life, right? Uh, just a fantastically functional into her nineties and, and a great human being, but, but, you know, did this the way I think all of us would love to. And, um, and so I, the, everything we can do to help people live well for whatever time we have, that's the objective. And that's what we're all about, right? At the end of the day, that's what we're here to do, not just for our patients, but for ourselves as well. And, you know, whatever we can do to, uh, these interventions, uh, are, are really, uh, really quite important. Um, Good. I'm so, gonna leave so, so to keep us on, to keep us on schedule, tell us your conclusions and then we'll uh, do a five minute break if that's what, uh, the boss wants. Okay. I think we have, my mom, no, we, you tell me when we're over. I think we have about three or four minutes left, but I, I think folks can read the conclusions as we answer questions. How's that? Are there are more questions in the, in the Q and A. Uh, there are, well, I mean, somebody has sort of a question we've sort of uh, circled around. What would you advise a patient who suppresses less than 20, but then creeps up at, say, less than 400? I mean, we sort of touched on that, but you want to address that specifically? They creep up not to 100 or 200, but less than 400? And there's no other the findings? The, the viral load? Yeah. That, yeah. Judy, you want to take that? Yeah, and then I'm going to have to drop off. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Yeah, so the over 200, I definitely would do resistance testing then and um, and think about making a change in the regimen. That's kind of my threshold. Right, and the other thing is that sometimes that's a signal that there's been an adherence problem. I'm amazed at how often I'll ask, and they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot to tell you, I had a month, I couldn't get my medicines for a month. Okay, fine, let's start them up again. So that, if nothing else, it should prompt an adherence uh, issue Um uh, so, any other questions? And uh, the last one is is uh, something we haven't addressed much. Uh, what do you do about ongoing inflammation in people who are stably suppressed on retroviral therapy? Yeah, I think that the notion is that that ongoing replication leads to inflammation. You stop the replication, and the inflammation comes down dramatically, but not to back to normal for reasons that nobody understands. And there seems to be just from that little bit of increased inflammation, it happens in hepatitis virus as well. It, it's badness. You see it with rheumatoid arthritis. You see it with a lot of other diseases. And, Roger, this leads to a lot of the metabolic things that you study a lot. Um, maybe I'll let you get the last word and uh, tell us what you think we can do about metabolic syndromes and um, yeah. any role well, for – Thank you so much. I, I think that the uh... ACTG study that suggested that if people are biologically suppressed, 
uh, uh, levels of inflammation, monocyte activation and, uh, uh, and, uh, and inflammation are more predictive of outcomes than, than even, even after controlling for CD4 count. The problem is that we don't know what to do about it. And uh, ever since Esprit and Silicat with uh, 12, uh, 2 and up to uh, Semiquivaroc and others, yeah, or Mega Art, uh, we, we haven't been able to address that residual inflammation. Uh, for the metabolic, uh, the last thing I would like to say is that uh, uh, even lately with uh, 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 FDA uh, adverse event reporting, it's now appearing that exposure to integrase inhibitors have been associated with uh, increased risk of insulin resistance and diabetes. Um, now, if though you look at that with the DAD and other studies suggesting that with people who gain weight on HIV uh, antiretroviral therapy are more likely to have uh, uh, insulin resistance and diabetes, even if we haven't seen a significant signal per se, it's something that we ought to pay attention to. Uh, I guess the light motive is that, like anything else I've said thus far, that we don't know what to do about it. <laughs> yeah, that's a fabulous way to end the, the session. We don't know much to do about it. But I think that's true for a lot of things as we go. So, Henry, I'll turn it back over to you to, to uh, take well, I think the audience probably thinks that Mike and I make the decisions, but actually Donna Jacobson from ISA USA <laughs> makes the decisions. And she has announced that there will be a five-minute break and no more. So, uh, in okay. uh, Four unless minutes, you think, get, Henry, unless you, and Mike, unless you think the audience wants to skip the break. I think the audience would like to take the break, but maybe we'll cut it down to five minutes. Yeah, okay. five minutes. Uh, so we'll be back at, uh, at least by my uh, watch at uh, 3.50. And we'll get to the residual questions. Okay. Thanks to the panel. Fabulous discussion. Great engagement. Very grateful for your time on this Thursday afternoon. Yeah, thanks for course correcting the uh, moderator. <laughs> Ha, <laughs>